Good evening, everybody. If y'all like to stand and worship with us. Why would I worry giants come calling my name? My God is so much bigger than troubles I Yeah. 
Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'll make room for you, Lord. Just come on in, do what you want to. I know I've made a mess of things. Come on, y'all. <laughs> oh, make room for the Lord. Hallelujah. God, we exalt you tonight. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. The psalmist said, endures forever. We make room for you tonight to move in our hearts, Lord. We make room tonight, God, for you to speak to us. We make room after the busyness of another day. We make room, God, for the Holy Spirit to whisper, to deposit, to encourage, to challenge us. In Jesus' name. Anybody here tonight, you're challenged with a health issue? I just hear the Lord touching my heart with that for right now. You're challenged with a health issue. Would you just come and stand just quickly? Come on, this is, we've got time for this. You're challenged with a health issue. Just come quickly. Come on. Ah, hallelujah. There you go. Come on quickly. Anyone else? Oh, my tradition. Break down the walls. Oh, my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground, oh my tradition. Break down the walls, oh my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground, oh my tradition. Break down the walls, oh my religion. Your way is better. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Stretch out your hand to these. I'm going to anoint them quickly, just walking across the, the front here. For he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon his back. And the word of God says, by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for my healing. Come on, thank Him. Thank you for my healing, Lord. Thank you that you were wounded for my transgressions. Thank you for my healing. Thank you for being Jehovah Rapha in my life, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for healing my body. And I believe that you are Hallelujah. Thank you for healing tonight, oh God. And I believe. Hallelujah. You're my healer, Lord. You're my healer. And I believe that you are all I Thank you for touching people, Lord. You're all we need, Jesus. You're all we need. You're all we need, and I believe that you are our portion, Jesus. And I believe it. More than enough. More than enough. Oh, Jesus, you're all I need. Jesus, you're all I need. And I believe. Oh, 
praise for being a healer tonight come on hallelujah thank you lord thank you lord thank you lord for being our healer we make room for you tonight to touch your people praise god praise the lord praise the lord i'm going to stand tonight i'll be all right standing up i don't want to sit down i've sat quite a bit today <laughs> hallelujah thank you lord Hallelujah. Well, the last, uh, this is our fourth week, the last series of time we've spent together here on Wednesday nights. We call it the, the journey of faith that, that taught us to, uh, to learn how to study the Bible. I hope you've employed some of those practical things we shared with you. We have all the cheat codes today. We have a, an Apple phone in our, in our possession. If you're not fortunate enough to have an Apple, they make something called an Android. Come on, somebody. <laughs> That's all right. The Lord love you. The Lord love you. <laughs> so you, uh, you have all the cheat codes. You can go to websites that have been set up for Bible study and they make it so easy. Uh, Pastor Joy learned just a week or so ago that there was software out there that she said, honey, they even make your slides for you. You know, Logos software. And uh, anyway, it's out there, but it costs you. And I just go to www.biblestudytools.com. Thank you, Chuck Swindoll. Amen. Many, many, many years ago, Chuck Swindoll was responsible for biblestudytools.com. He's a, he's a wonderful man, great preacher of the gospel. And then we followed that, uh, Pastor Billy preached a powerful message on prayer, amen, prayer. And we came back last week with, uh, is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to let the oppressed go free, and that you do what? Come on, y'all, break every yoke. Y'all need to go back and listen to last week, y'all, come on. <laughs> from the book of Isaiah. And so tonight we're gonna to talk about one of the last, uh, the last thing we're gonna talk about is the value and the importance of speaking up. Somebody say speak up. Yeah. It's really about the call to share Christ. I love, uh, I love opportunities to just practically share my relationship with Christ with other people. For example, I go into a restaurant and I, I practice this, if you've ever been out to eat with me publicly, uh, you've seen me, maybe seen me do this, I do it quite often. You know, you'll sit down and they bring you a menu and um, start looking at it, and as soon as the lady drops the menu, I say, hey, what, what's your name, dear? And she'll say, well, my name's Karen. I say, Karen, my wife and I are gonna be ordering here shortly and, and we're gonna be getting ready to eat when you bring us our food. And we're going to say the blessing over our food. Could you tell me something that you're praying about, something you would like for us to pray about? It's so non-threatening. So non-threatening. So what am I stating to her? I'm stating that I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I haven't said, are you a Christian? I haven't thrown any questions out at him. Just saying, hey, I'm, I'm a man of faith. I believe that God answers prayer. And I'd like to, as we say our blessing, I'd like to pray for you. And sometimes, man, I've had, I mean, I've had waitresses break down and start crying, you know. I've had, I've had them just, hold on a second, you know, can't speak. Because they were just set up to come to my table. Come on, y'all believe in divine setups? So that's so non-threatening. You can do that. And, uh, and then as soon as we get our food, Lord, I thank you for this food. Lord, I thank you for Karen tonight. I thank you, Lord, that, 
that you see her where she is. She's working in this restaurant. She's expressed the desire that you touch her child who's struggling in a health issue. In Jesus' name, bless our food, bless our time together, and bless Karen as she serves us. In the name of Jesus, the strong Son of God, amen. Come on, that was so easy, wasn't it? Give the Lord praise. That was so easy. That is a super way of sharing Christ and speaking up and sharing your faith, and it's so non-threatening to people. It just makes it so, so easy. So just go ahead and do what your pastor said, okay? Speak up the call to share Christ. Statistics tell us that, here's the shocking thing, only 2%, 2%, we're not talking about milk here, okay? 2% of evangelical Christians have ever won a single person to Jesus. Come on now, let that sink in. I, did you hear what I said? 2% of evangelical Christians whose lives have been snatched from the fire, they've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they're a part of a local church that they've ever had the experience of personally winning someone else to Jesus Christ. Now the winning them to Jesus is qualified like this. It means you witness to them, you built a relationship with them, you took them to a worship setting, invited them to your church, you led them to a decision for Christ, you took them by the hand into discipleship, spent some time with them, and taught them the basics of the Christian faith. That, that's what we're talking about. Anybody inviting somebody to church. But how many of you have ever won somebody to Christ, walked with them hand in hand? In other words, you were able to take that single person and say, you know what, I was responsible for that sal their sal salvation. That means that 98% of Christians today have never personally been responsible. 98% have never personally been responsible for leading people to Jesus. Only 2%. That's a strong, strong statistic. 98% of them assume that, well, that's the clergy's job. That's what we pay the pastor for. Come on, y'all, wake up. It's Wednesday night, y'all. Come on. <laughs> that's what we pay the pastor for. He's got to build his church, okay? He's got, he ain't doing his job. We got empty seats, all right? No, 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 you're not doing your job, Okay? My job is to inspire you. My job is to be used by God to bring you under conviction. My job is to be used by God to encourage you and nurture you in your faith so that you'll get excited about winning people for Jesus Christ. Amen? 98% assume that that's just a task of the pastor. Those guys are the paid ones after all. Come on, you can touch your neighbor anytime and say, speak up, man, speak up, okay? <laughs> speak up. Our text for this sermon is going to be found in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15. Let's look at it together. But in your hearts, Peter speaking here, Peter the apostle, Peter the one who's willing to speak up, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord and always, how often? Always. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for this hope that you have. Okay, this peace that you walk in, this relationship with God that you've always be ready. In other words, you and I are called to do this. We're called to share the gospel. We're called to speak up, if you will. And Peter says, tell them the reason for the hope in your life. Tell them the reason for your hope of life eternal. Tell them the reason why you trust God and believe that he has a place for you in eternity prepared just for you. You see, we're good at worship. We're good at singing. We're real good at coming to the building. We're real good at dropping a few bucks in the bucket. But how many souls are we winning to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Come on. I'm hearing y'all now. Talk back to me now. How good are we at winning people to Christ? We're good at the gathering. We're good at the singing. We're good at the feel-good experiences. They excite us and they appeal to our senses sometimes. But these things that we enjoy do not lead people out of darkness into the light of the gospel. Somebody's got to push the detonator button, all right? Somebody's got to share the truth that brings a person to conviction and ultimately to salvation. 
Because you and I are charged with what? The great commission. This great commission that Jesus left us with before he left this earth and he ascended into the heavens. He left us with this divine responsibility and the fact that we enjoy worship doesn't bother the devil. Come on, y'all. The fact that we enjoy, you know, getting together with believers of like precious faith and, oh, I love Sunday morning, man, seeing God's people gather together. That doesn't bother the devil at all. What bothers the devil is when you get on the territory trying to snatch one of his followers out of darkness into the light of the gospel. When you share the truth to somebody who doesn't know God, that's when the devil gets restless. Somebody say, speak up. Yeah. Romans 1.16, Paul said it like this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. I'm not ashamed. I'm willing to, to speak up. I'm willing to say something to get a person's attention. I'm reminded of a story of a man. I love this story. <laughs> it's a man who had gone to a party and he had partaken of the, of the brew. You know, long necks, Bud Lights, the wine. He, he, he just got it kind of inebriated. He was drunk. But he had enough sense about him to not get in his car. He had a little bit of sense left, so he said, you know what, I'm not going to drive home. He decided that he would take the long journey home, but as he walked toward his house, he remembered a shortcut that would take him through the graveyard. Hmm. And as fate would have it, the funeral home had a service plan for the next day, and they had dug a deep, deep grave and they, for some reason, you know, you've walked, but seen the graveyards and they got the hole ready and they put tarps over it, you know, and maybe a little sign, caution. But they accidentally just kind of left this one uncovered. And so he walked across that dark graveyard and staggered his way through the tombstones until he walked right into that empty grave. Suddenly he realizes he's hit the bottom. He reaches up and he begins to claw and to scratch and claw and scratch and scrape, but all he could do was just pull more dirt from off of the sides of that empty grave. And exhausted at his efforts, he decided that there's just no way I'm going to get out of here tonight. It's pitch dark out there. I can't see anything. I don't have my Apple phone with me, okay? <laughs> that's, that's the infomercial, y'all. Come on. So he just sat down in the dark corner of that grave. And it was chilly, so he kind of pulled his knees up close to his chest and just kind of sat there in the corner. And to his shock, it wasn't long before someone else who had found themselves in inebriated decided that they would take the same shortcut that he took. And they were on their way, and they did the same thing he did. They fell into the grave. And they started, he, and this man just kind of sat there and watched and he saw the man scrape and claw and he saw him get exasperated and exhausted and he is about to just give up and, and do the same thing that the other guy whom he has not seen done. And so just about the time he gets ready to take a seat, he hears a voice from the corner saying, you may as well give up, you're not getting out. But he did, he got out, okay. <laughs> He got out. <laughs> Y'all are getting this, aren't you? <laughs> he did get out, and the moral of that story is this. It is usually necessary for someone to speak up if people are ever going to get out of the pit. Okay? <laughs> All right? <laughs> Some people have gone to unusual measures to get people to make a commitment to Christ. Man, if I could just get a soul saved, they're thinking, you know, going to get somebody to commit to Jesus. This is a story of a man by the name of Eugene Peterson. That name might ring a bell to some of y'all. Eugene, as a young boy, was raised in a very, very solid Christian home. And his mother and his father were devout believers. And they had impacted the life of Eugene so much that he would take a different verse of Scripture to school with him every day. 
He would commit it to his memory. His mother would hold him accountable. He'd commit it to his memory. He would spend his time learning the Bible while other people did normal school behaviors, sports, recess, monkey bars. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. And, and Eugene was teased because of this, and, and his friends, his so-called friends, would call Eugene the Jesus sissy. Okay? He looked a little anemic, a little bit weak. He was often picked on. And the story goes that the class bully, whose name was Garrison John, would pick Eugene out because he was so much of an easy target to bully. He came up to Eugene and he slapped him in the face a few times. And he said, now what are you going to do about it? Eugene knew the scriptures and he knew the Bible well. And he looked at that boy right smack in the face and he said, blessed are those who persecute you and turn the other cheek. This happened over and over again. He said he would go home and his mom would look at him and he'd see him kind of gotten tussled up a little bit. He said, was that Garrison? Has Garrison been on you again? He would tell his mama, he said, mama, I stood firm. I didn't fight back. I held myself to the word of God and I, I did like Jesus said and I turned the other cheek. One day Eugene said that Garrison did something a little different. Garrison, rather than then a few slaps in the face, Garrison called him a Jesus sissy one time and reared back and just, just cold-cocked Eugene and knocked him to the ground. And he said, before I knew it, I got up on my feet and I lunged toward Garrison. A little courage built up there. And he said he had these rather long fingernails and he managed to clasp his throat with all of his strength and he clamped down on Garrison's vocal and on his esophagus and he had him right where he wanted. And he said then he took his knee upward and caught him right in the stomach, gave him a gut punch and he knocked him over and he got on top of him and he beat that bully as hard as he could beat him. He said, say uncle! Any of y'all ever grow up into say uncle days? He said, say uncle. He said, I thought I had taken control of the situation. I'd take it a little, bit, a little bit further. He said, I socked that bully one more time right in his bleeding nose. And I said, say I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. He said, Garrison with a shaky voice said, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Okay. He said, went down in history saying, he was my very first convert. Thank you, Pastor Joy. She's been reading my notes, y'all. <laughs> I admit, I, <laughs> I don't think you ought to go that far to say you got a convert, okay? <laughs> but I do think there ought to be a little more persuasion than what some of the church is doing today. We at least ought to speak up. We at least ought to pray for the lady who waits on us, the guy who serves us at the restaurant. John records the story of Jesus coming down the road and coming in the midst of John the Baptist. You know the story. And John, also known as the forerunner of Christ, was there with two of his disciples. And the Bible says that he spoke up and he released those famous words from John 1.36. Behold, the Lamb of God. He speaks up. Behold, the Lamb of God. It takes away the sins of the world. John had several followers of his baptism. He had several disciples of his teaching. And the Bible declares that when John the Baptist uttered those words, Behold the Lamb of God, that two of his disciples turned. Two of them turned and began now to do what? To follow Jesus. As they begin to follow Jesus, Jesus turns around and asks them, What do you want? And one of them responded and said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where do you live? Where are you staying? And Jesus said to them, you come with me and you'll see. And so it is that we know that the one that spoke up that day to talk to Jesus was Andrew. Andrew. Andrew's life was so changed that he goes to his brother Simon. Simon was just a simple, plain fisherman. He caught fish. I've been to his crib on the shores of the Galilee. It's a beautiful place. He sold fish. He made his living by the sea. He was a leader in his trade, when Peter came into came into the room, the light would come on, or as if it's, when Peter came in, you know, everybody paid attention. When Peter walked into the room, folks knew he was present. He was that kind of a leader. He was that kind of guy. He was very outspoken. And Andrew saw his brother's need. John 141 says this. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother. Look at this, y'all. 
the first thing after Andrew's life has been changed. He finds his brother Simon and he tells him, we found the Messiah that is the Christ. Do you see what Andrew did as soon as his life is changed by Christ? He speaks up. He opens his mouth. He opens his heart. He shares the reality of faith in Christ to, to his loved ones. The question for you tonight is this. Have you even shared the gospel with your family? Have you, have you shared the gospel with your family? Does everybody in your family know about the awesome change that God has made in your life? Does everybody know of the purpose in which you live? Does everybody know why you keep coming to Carpenter Shop International Church and why you support the works of the ministry? Does everybody know that? The very first convert recorded in the scriptures in the New Testament is Andrew leading his brother Simon to Jesus Christ. Trivia question. Who's the first convert in the New Testament? Andrew leading his brother Simon to Jesus. As the story continues, you look at Simon standing in the presence of Jesus. Look at John 1, And he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated is Peter. Andrew is known in the Scripture as the one who spoke up. He spoke up and saw that his brother was brought into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. There's another place in the Bible where Andrew shows up and speaks up, and there are actually three places that highlight Andrew doing this, and, and in this message we just mentioned two of them. John 6 records the story of Jesus teaching the masses. There were thousands there, and Jesus turns to Philip and says, hey man, well, you know, where are we going to buy bread to feed all these people? Where are we going to buy bread to feed all these people? Philip said, I don't know much about this. But he said, I do know this. It would take you eight months of wages to feed that crowd. And, and, then, and even if we had the money, where in the world would we go and buy this much food? They don't have a Sam's Club, okay? <laughs> where would we buy this food? Look at John chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter, spoke up. Notice what it says here. He did what? He spoke up. And he said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? You see, when everybody else was bewildered, when everyone else was wondering what's going to happen, when everybody else is, is not willing to do anything, he's willing to do what? Speak up. Speak up and tell him, you know someone who can take care of this. Here's a little boy who packed his lunch. He's got five loaves of barley and two fish. Sometimes you just have to be willing to speak up. And when you learn the guts to speak up, I can tell you this from experience, God will do the rest. How many of you know that he'll give you the words? When you don't even know the words to share, God will give you the words to say. I love your post today on Facebook, Elijah. She talked about the miracles that God, how many of you saw her post? God is doing so much work where? In my family. Did you see it, y'all? In my family, God is doing so much work, which means that Elasia has not been quiet while she's willing to get in a car and ride to a city an hour away, week after week after week. Why? Because she's willing to speak up. Come on, y'all. To God be the glory for what he's doing in your family. She gave glory to God in the post. And how God has been faithful to do what God does. You know the story that we just referenced. God did so much work that day. Many, many that day were blessed to eat at the feet of Jesus. Many that day were blessed by the master. Many that day heard the truths of the kingdom of God because Andrew was simply willing to speak up. And if you and I will cultivate the willingness just to speak up, we will see God move. Listen, friends, we don't need an empty seat in the house of the Lord. It ought, to, it ought to grieve our hearts to see that there are empty spaces week after week after week because time is short. The world is corrupt. We are getting closer and closer and closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't we speak up? Can't we take inventory of our family, our neighbors, our friends? Does it even bother you that people are going to hell every day? Tony Campolo. Tony Campolo was a Baptist revivalist. He was in a crowd of people that numbered 28 to 30,000 people in a Colosseum. And he preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when he got down to the altar service, the story goes that that Tony Campolo stepped up to the microphone and 
He talked about salvation and talked about the need for people to share their faith so that folk can be snatched out of darkness into the light of the gospel. He said, let me tell you something, man. It bothers me because some of your own family members are going to hell in a handbasket and you don't give up. And he used the D word. And when he did, that 28,000 people went, oh! The whole crowd just went berserk. Because the Baptist revivalists had used the D word. He walked across the platform and he waited for the crowd to calm down. And he said, in fact, some of you are more upset at my choice of words than you are your own family busting hell wide open. And the crowd was broken and God moved with power. Does it bother you that some of your family members are going to hell? Does it even make you think that you, that you do have a responsibility to the world? And some of you are asking the same question uh, you know, that Cain was asking. Am I my brother's keeper? I'm just going to mind my business. I'm just going to leave people alone. I'm just going to stay to myself. No, God wants you to be the salt of the earth. He wants you to be the city set upon a hill that is not hidden. He wants you to speak up. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you, yes, you are your brother's keeper. You are your neighbor's keeper. You are your friend's keeper. You, you who have come to Christ are responsible to speak up. Speak up and tell people about this work that he has done in your life. When you and I begin to see the lost come to Jesus, there will be an even greater excitement in this house. There will be nothing that ignites a church anymore than lost people coming to Jesus. That's when revival truly hits the house of God. Some of you may be hearing this and say, well, Pastor, you know, I just have a hard time when it comes to sharing my faith with other people. That's why you need the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And you shall receive power. The word there is translated what? Dunamis dynamics. When you need the dynamics of the Holy Spirit to help you when you do not know what to say. He didn't say that you might witness. He didn't say that you could choose to witness. He didn't say that maybe you would witness. He said you shall be my witnesses. The, 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 the reality and the evidence of that you are filled with the Holy Spirit may not necessarily be tongues. It's the fact that you're willing to point people to Jesus Christ. Come on y'all. God's power enables you to speak up. When you don't even know what to say, he speaks for you. You make room. You make room for God to use you. And I promise you he will. That's the agenda for your redeemed life. Peter is the example. Look at what happened on the day of Pentecost. Peter stood up and he spoke up. That'll, that'll preach right there. He stood up and he spoke up. Peter took the initiative to do something. He took on religious leaders. He took on the powers that be. He took on the whole crowd because he was allowing the Spirit of God to move freely in his life. You and I have to do something. Scripture bears out that God's people who are redeemed are the ones that are called upon to do something. Dr. Wilbur Chapman, who's a great evangelist, said this. There are 40 times in the Scriptures where people were healed of something. There were 34 times out of those 40 where persons are caught bringing people to Jesus. Somebody did something. Somebody brought them. Somebody accompanied them. Somebody went with them. You and I must do the same. We must speak up. We must invite. We must be willing to pick up. Hey, would you go to church with me? I saw uh, Tamika put a post on there the other day. Hey, if you're willing to go to church with me, I'll go the distance. I'll even buy your lunch. I started to say, I'll be willing to go with you, Tamika. But I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work. She's probably going to say, Lynn, you, you already got your meal taken care of. <laughs> if you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, hear this. You have all that you need. You have the relationship with Jesus. You have the testimony of what God did for you when he brought you out of darkness. You have the command from him to go and make disciples. You have the Holy Spirit to empower you to be the dunamis, the dynamics that, that you need to preach the gospel. All you have to do is open your mouth and speak up. Can you get the message here? We're too much like a football team stuck in the huddle. 
In the huddle, you make the plan. In the huddle, you tell the tight ends what they got to do. In the huddle, you say the guards, this is what you need to do. In the huddle, you position the linebackers. In the huddle, you call the play. In the huddle, you tell the running back which one or the receiver, whoever's going to receive the ball. But there comes a time when you have to say, snap, okay? And you have to snap the ball. 228, 228, hut, hut. There comes a time when you have to snap the ball. And make the play. And what God is saying to us tonight is it's time that you and I snap the ball. Share the gospel. Make it your purpose. Have you ever thought about this, God? Why don't, would you allow me, Lord, to lead one soul to Jesus this month? Come on. If you, let, think about it. What if everybody in this church said, Lord, would you let me lead at, at least one person to Jesus in the month of April? And you would start to pay attention to who it is you're standing in front of and who it is that's behind you in the Walmart or who it is that's in front of you in the, in, in the, in the, in the grocery store, whatever. Let me start paying attention to where it is that God places me. We can't stay in the huddle. The church can't stay in the huddle. The huddle is full of talk. The huddle is full of chatter. The huddle is, oh, the music's too loud. The huddle says, well, the church is cold. The pastor didn't speak to me. The huddle says, do you like this church? The huddle says, no. Do you like the worship team? No. The huddle will get you in trouble. But when you begin to speak up and move outside of the huddle and play the play that God has set before you, and souls will be touched. Souls will be touched. Hebrews 9, 27, appointed unto men at once to die, and after this, the judgment. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 4, 12, there's no other name under the heavens, and that's a big canopy whereby we must be saved. The name of what? Jesus Christ. When's the last time you spoke up and told somebody about the work that Christ has done in your life? You have relationships with people on your job. You have relationships with people in your neighborhood, people you work with, your family. Let me close with this final story. In his book, The No Guilt Guide to Witnessing, George Sweeting tells this story of a man named John Courier. John Courier, sentenced in 1949 to, here we go, life in prison without parole for murder. Life in prison. After a number of years, because of excellent behavior, he was sent to a work farm, a prison work farm. He was a model prisoner, but he was still a prisoner in 1968. You calculate that in your mind and you'll come up with 19 years later into his sentence. He served 19 years. Someone comes forward. Someone comes forward, Lewis, and gives the truth, gives the details that they were the one who had committed the crime, not John Courier. A letter was sent to him telling him that his sentence is now officially terminated. But he never got the letter. The work on the farm was hard. Ten more years went by. He still hadn't got the letter. And a parole officer heard about John Courier, who has now worked 30 total years for a crime that he did not commit. He dug out the information, and he went with copies of the official papers to let John Courier go free. Sweeting in his book said, would it matter to you that someone sent an urgent message to you, a message that would forever change your life, but you never got it? Are y'all are are y'all getting this? Are you getting what I'm saying tonight? Somebody sent an urgent message to you, but you never got the message. 
Why? Because people weren't willing to speak up. God, break our, break our hearts, Lord, for what breaks yours. Proverbs says, he that winneth souls is wise. Break our hearts, God, for what breaks yours, that we would somehow be willing to share the gospel. I don't know what judgment day is going to be like, but I believe high, high, high on the list of what God Almighty is going to look for from our lives. <laughs> is how we handled the gospel. <laughs> what did we do? What did we do with the message? Just went to church. Love my pastor. Love old Pastor Wallace. He's a good guy. Love my church. Love that worship team. They can sing, man. God wants you to go to church and He wants you to love your pastor. He wants you to love your worship team. But I'm here to tell you tonight that more than anything else, God wants you to speak up. He does. He, he wants you to speak up and, and share the gospel. He wants you to be like Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. I close with the same verse I opened with. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Well, Pastor, what, what should I do? You should identify lost people in your life. Your family, your friends, your neighbors. Pray for their salvation and ask the Lord for an opportunity <laughs> to be able to speak up. Is there anybody here that you know folk that don't have a relationship with Christ and it just bothers you? Could you dare take a few minutes and just come to this altar and call their names before the Lord and say, God, give me an opportunity. Give me an opportunity, Lord, to say something to them.
Father, collectively, we call the names of individuals before your throne. Trusting and believing, God, that you give us opportunity, but even greater that, trusting and believing that, that you will place someone in their path, even if it's not us, that will lead that person to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Andrew did it. He saw his brother Simon swept into the kingdom. A mighty man of God who would be used on the day of Pentecost to stand up and lift up his voice. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to speak up. And on the final moment of faith, I want you at the count of three, I'm going to count to three just a moment. I want you to shout the name, just the first name of that person that you prayed for tonight. Just shout the name. Let heaven hear you, would you? Shout the name of that person that you'd like to see come to faith in Jesus Christ. Here we go. One, two, three. Come on, give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for divine opportunities, God. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. No turn. No turn. give the Lord praise would you now regardless of whether you have a, an Apple or an Android go to Facebook Carpenter Shop International Church the broadcast from tonight hit share exponentially you'll send the same sermon that I just preached to multiplied thousands of people okay just go there you did this a couple of weeks ago and our numbers just went berserk on a Wednesday night Bible study. All you have to do, find it, hit share. That's all you got to do. God bless you. Please fellowship among yourselves before you leave tonight. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Amen.